September 22nd, 2021 meeting of the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee to order. Um, welcome and thank you all for joining us today. We've got, I think, a really uh, important and interesting agenda um, for today. Uh, I am Representative Jerry Paulette and current chair of the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee. Um, I'd like to, uh, we'll be going through a um, roll call. And so as we do so, I'd like to, we'll have introductions of the four members of the executive committee uh, of the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee. And our agenda today, um, since we have um, a quorum, uh, includes approval of minutes. Uh, that is not the biggest and exciting news of the day. Um, we'll look at the 2022 meeting schedule, and then we will have an update on the implementation of SB 5405, uh, prime sponsored by our own member, Senator Bob Hasegawa, um, which is embarking us on a groundbreaking effort to include racial equity analyses in JLARC's um, uh, audits and studies. And I'm very excited about the work that's being done here. Uh, we will then be looking at the review of the healthcare authority's budget structure with a preliminary report, uh, followed by examination of impact fee deferral programs for local government GMA uh, impact fees. And then we will be looking at the uh, significant work to be done, always a major part of the Joint Legislative Audit Review Committee's annual work plan, which is looking at tax preference reviews that will be conducted by the staff and reviewed by us and the Citizens Commission on Tax Preferences um, during 2022. And there are three um, specific re reviews that we'll be highlighting. Um, and that is uh, the agenda for this morning's session. This afternoon, I wanna remind everyone that we will have an I-900 performance audit uh, meeting uh, for the I-900 subcommittee, which is all of us. Um, and that meets at 1.30 and the state auditor's office will be presenting the final audit report on assessing workplace culture at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, uh, uh, I have a conflict and vice chair, Senator Wilson will be chairing the I-900 meeting. Um, I will may be able to join for a very short period of time, but I th thank Senator Wilson for being willing to chair the meeting. Thank you very much this afternoon. I encourage everyone to join. It'll be, I think, very important meeting. Any questions about our agenda before we do the roll call? Senator Hasegawa. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Is my, yeah, I was just wondering if I could ask staff if the um, link on the EBB for the committee is functional because it doesn't seem to work for me. We'll look into that right, right away. Thank you. Um, the agenda <clears throat> should have links that you receive by email should have links to each of the reports and action items. Yeah, and if, if I may, Mr. Chair, but, um, uh, Liz, could, could you just resend around the, um, the agenda with the links to Senator Hasegawa and all the other members, just make sure that they're not having any difficulty finding it? Of course. That's great, thank you. All right, uh, I'm sure that everyone else was probably wondering the same thing, but you had the courage to raise your hand, Senator Hasegawa, and ask if it was really working. <laughs> um, with that, um, would uh, our staff please do the roll call for members for the record? Yes, thank you. This is a roll call for attendance at the September 22nd, 2021 JLARC meeting. Uh, Representative Berg. Present. Representative Fai. Present. Representative Frame. 
Uh, Representative Gaynor. I thought I saw him. Uh, He's here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Senator Hasegawa. Here. Uh, Representative Hoff. Here. Senator uh, Lovelet. Senator Mullet. Here. Uh, Representative Orcutt. Present. Representative Paulette. Present. Senator Rivers. Here. Senator Saldana. Here. <clears throat> Senator Short. Uh, Sen uh, excuse me, Representative Stokesbury. <clears throat> uh, Senator Wagner. Wagner is present. And Senator Wilson. Wilson is here. Uh, we have 12 in attendance, so we do have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just uh, as way of introduction or reminder, um, uh, Senator Wilson is on the and go through the members of the executive committee. Senator Wilson is vice chair for the two year term. Uh, Representative Ed Orcutt is secretary and Senator Mullet is uh, chair emeritus and uh, assistant secretary. And I want to- can't, But nobody can Mullet. read my handwriting. So I'm the world's worst secretary. I'm the secretary <laughs> of illegible, illegible handwriting. Uh, but I want to thank Senator Mullet for um, his assistance as I came into office as chair and um, briefing me and assisting me in a smooth transition. Thank you very much. Representative Orcutt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move adoption of the minutes from July 21st, 2021. Do we have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Um, I know everyone has read them, and so I will ask if there is any discussion or concerns to object to uh, adoption. Not hearing any, I'm going to ask for a simple voice vote. Um, please, everyone, if you are in favor of adoption, say aye or yes, and your name and um, we'll have a cacophony of sound all at once. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Paulette, aye. Representative Orca, aye. Representative Orca, aye. Aye. Representative aye. aye. Beautiful sound. Um, are there any members who vote no? Not hearing any. And are there any abstentions? Not hearing any. The minutes are adopted. Thank you very much. Um, like to introduce our really terrific legislative auditor, um, Keenan Konoposky, um, to review the meeting schedule. And um, I just I do want to let people know that the executive committee met earlier this week, and after consideration and deliberations over a period of time. Um, the executive committee has had examined the compensation for our state's legislative auditor in comparison to the relevant positions around the nation and other positions that are relative in Washington state and approved a merit increase and signaled our intent to add another merit increase one year from now. Our state legislative auditor's office is nationally recognized as if not the very best in the nation, one of the top ones, the most credible, strongest. Um, its research products are looked to across the nation as well as we know um, across Washington state. And I wanna thank um, Auditor Konopaski for the tremendous leadership he has provided to us and the staff and service to the state of Washington. Uh, with that, um, would you like to introduce the meeting schedule? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Keenan Konopaski, the legislative auditor. First of all, uh, um, thank you for the gracious comments. Um, I, I appreciate the recognition 
Um, and also, of course, want to point out that um, the work that I think we do such a great job of helping the legislature with would not be possible if it wasn't for the great JLARC staff that we have in the office. And uh, so I want to make sure we recognize their wonderful contributions, as you'll see in the rest of the agenda. They do tremendous work. Um, the um, item in the agenda shows the uh, proposed meeting dates for the JLARC committee through 2023. Um, and of course, I know that's sounding like it's <laughs> out, out there quite a ways, um, but we like to um, make sure we get these available so that people can get them on their calendar and the public is aware. Um, you will see that um, um, we have slots for every month, but um, there are um, six dates that we typically have a meeting or five typically um, where the regular JLARC committee convenes. And then every month we make sure there's a, a, a hearing date set aside for our I-900 subcommittees as Representative Paul had said, you know, uh, it's a subcommittee of the whole. And uh, those are set aside because there's a requirement for um, holding a public hearing within 30 days of the state auditor's office releasing one of their audits, because that's what those hearings are all about <clears throat> is the separately elected state auditor's reports, which we will hear about this afternoon. So we make sure that we have one every month uh, in, uh, to be prepared in case reports get released. But typically there's a, a decent number of those where there's a specific month where the state auditor doesn't have a report and as soon as we're able to uh, have a determination on that, we make sure that um, you and your staff know that you can free those calendar dates up. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out for folks is that um, uh, we've, we've slotted these at, at 1 p.m. Um, per our normal process we had been using um, when the legislature was meeting in person. And of course the decision on whether meetings next year will be in person or virtual has yet to be determined. So at this point, we're um, gonna um, suggest we reserve them at 1 p.m. in case we do meet in person. Um, in, the, in the event of a virtual meeting, we've, we've usually tried to shift those to, to 1.30 to allow a little bit more time for people's schedules while they're away from the office. And I'd be happy to see if there's any questions. Not seeing any questions. So um, it, that's the great thing about kind of being first on people's calendars. Um, you're, you're looking so far enough ahead that hopefully we can put and reserve time now. Um, shall we go to implementation of SB 5405? And thank you again, Mr. Chair. Again, Keenan Konopaski, the Legislative Auditor, and uh, I have with me today um, Rebecca Connolly and Eric Whitaker from staff from my office to the committee. And uh, we're here to give you a status update. You know, this is a, a, in advance of the rest of uh, the remaining part of the agenda where we're going to talk about some um, actual audit results and future studies. This is a, um, an item that um, the chair asked me if I could provide periodic updates for this new assignment, as he was saying when he explained it, uh, was explaining the agenda earlier, that's been um, uh, directed towards the, the office in the committee. And that's for um, in gross substitute Senate Bill 5405, which um, directs the office to start conducting racial equity analyses within the scope of our uh, studies. So with that, if you could advance the slide to the next page. We'll just remind folks briefly about the directive in the in the bill, which was um, um, pretty brief and straightforward, although there's complicated implications to do this well. Uh, the committee shall incorporate a racial equity analysis into its performance audit sunset reviews and other audits reports. And then there was additional language in the bill um, noting that um, or explaining that when we have audits and reviews 
and reports where um, there's a determination that a racial equity analysis is not necessary or appropriate, we need to be specifying that directly to the committee. So I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca and Eric to talk a little bit about some of the initial steps and the initial observations we've had as we've been learning and figuring out how we might start approaching this work going forward. Thank you, Keenan. Um, over the past few months, uh, our work has focused on outreach, research, and staff development. Uh, the mandate listed seven commissions that we could work with in developing our approach. Uh, this includes the Office of Equity, the Commission on African American Affairs, the Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs, and the Commission on Hispanic Affairs. Uh, we have met with all of their executive directors. And in addition, we met with uh, some JLARC members who indicated an interest and uh, all JLARC staff. We've met with state agencies, including the State Board of Health. And uh, we've also met with some other auditing entities. And one key takeaway from the discussions we've been having, and this is something that the directors of the commissions cautioned us explicitly about, is that um, equity can have uh, different meanings and could be understood differently depending on the context and who you're talking to. So that's one of the things we need to keep in mind. Uh, we've also spent time researching uh, best practices, uh, looking at tools that are being used for equity analyses and reviewing literature. Uh, we worked with a team of graduate students from uh, UW's Evans School and they produced a capstone report for us on various approaches that uh, could be used for equity analysis. We've also started some staff training to expand our capabilities to do these analyses moving forward. And this includes certificate training for four staff members and uh, all staff training on evidence-based approaches to addressing bias. Now, uh, Eric is going to talk about some of our initial observations. Thanks, Rebecca. So one of the things that we learned is that uh, broadly, the world of equity evaluation is evolving. Washington is in the early stages of developing and implementing equity planning and performance metrics. And JLARC's mandate is unique in its breadth and approach sort of compared to other, other jurisdictions. And so many of the other jurisdictions that are doing this type of analysis so within specific policy areas such as education or criminal justice and many of those entities also tend to have a prospective focus rather than a retrospective focus in the auditing profession specifically study questions and approaches are being updated as well so new audit standards note that study questions may include equitable access and equity and resource distribution and while examples do exist, there is no one, there's likely no one size fits all approach. And so conducting racial equity analysis within the broader performance auditing environment will likely be study specific. And in terms of data considerations, we learned that disaggregated data will be important. It's sort of the gold standard in this, in this area of research. This disaggregated data just simply means that the quantitative data for a program or policy can be broken down into relevant and meaningful categories. And in this case, it would be racial and ethnic categories. Currently, these data are often unavailable, but this may change as agencies implement their equity plans. And we also heard that stories are important in understanding the specific programs and might provide some context for the quantitative data. However, it's important to point out that qualitative data are sometimes challenging to evaluate objectively. Uh, unless there are questions about our observations, I'll turn it back over to Keenan to discuss the principles. I'm just pausing to see if there's any questions, Mr. Chair. I'm ready to move to the next section if folks are ready. I don't see the participant list, so if you, if staff would help me if identify if there is anyone raising their hand. I, it doesn't, I can scanning through it. I don't see anybody at this point and I'll keep an eye on that as well as I can for you, Mr. Chair, as well. So, uh, uh, um, the next item I have in the presentation is, um, as we're proceeding with this, um, you know, I first wanted to just uh, provide a, um, uh, an observation about um, our, in, in general, um, proceeding with this work on this is, um, I do feel very, very optimistic that we're 
going to be able to really provide some significant information as we go forward in this effort that is credible and helpful to informing the legislature, just as with all of our work. It's a, it's a new area of inquiry for us, but um, I think we will be very successful in helping provide some information that all of you will use in a meaningful way as you consider policy in the future. Um, that said, um, I did take some time to um, uh, go over some key principles that are um, going to be important as we consider doing this work in the future. And I have um, spent quite a bit of time um, reviewing this with the executive committee. And um, I think it's, it, um, hopefully, I think it's fair to characterize, Mr. Chair, that, uh, that uh, I think we got endorsement from the four executive committee members that they think these are important and um, rational principles for us to consider as we move forward with this, with this work. Indeed we have. So I'd just like to go over these five quickly and see if there's any questions. Um, the first is JLARC staff will conduct racial equity analyses using the same rigorous, um, the same professional judgment, rigorous evidence and methods and independence required for performance audits. And that's just kind of emphasizing that even though this is a new area of inquiry, uh, we're still gonna do it through the lens of the objective independent evidence-based work that we do all the time for all of you. Um, and key to that, maybe if you could advance to the next slide is, is pointing out some context of, of what that does mean when we do performance auditing is kind of a refresher on three really key important points that have to be considered when you do a performance audit under the yellow book standards that are issued from the federal government accountability offices, we are required, required to follow by law. Um, and those three key elements are, the, the first is the what is, sometimes um, referred in a nerdy audit language as condition, but that, that's you know, basically trying to find the rigorous sufficient evidence about what is taking place for a given program that you're evaluating. And, but when you're doing that in a performance audit um, approach, you're always looking for the what should be to compare it to, often called the audit criteria. So what are the expectations for what should be happening when you find that evidence? And then the third part is um, if there is a gap or shortfall in, uh, in meeting those expectations of the criteria, um, auditors are, are required to, um, if they wanna weigh in with a recommendation for changing or improving something, they need to have good credible evidence for what's causing that gap. And I'm just pointing that out to, to all of you and, and, and for the public, because this is not different than our other work from the perspective of we're going to be following the same requirements to be looking for each of these three elements in every performance audit we do. And um, that isn't to say that we will always be successful at finding those, but that will be our thing that we're striving for. And at times there can be challenges to make sure you have enough evidence for each of those three parts to weigh in with a, a, an affirmative audit conclusion. So why don't we, yeah, why don't we move to the next one? The second principle, racial equity analyses must be related to the purpose of the original study mandate and fall within the scope of that mandate. And this is uh, pointing out that um, uh, while we have this new directive in 5405, it's a broad directive that isn't study specific. And as all of you know, we've adopted a, a work plan recently. We have specific studies that are directed separately through other pieces of legislation, either in um, separate policy bills or in language that's provisional language in the um, uh, Budget Act in the section of appropriations for JLR. And so what we are going to need to do is find out how we can consider what, what type of analysis that we might do on racial equity is related to the mandates that are separately issued in those other directives. And uh, one example I like to throw out because sometimes maybe we may be concluding that there isn't a racial equity issue is reminding you recently as an example case study of a uh, um, analysis we did at the state patrol um, year-ish ago 
And you will recall that the specific mandate we had in the transportation budget was to identify whether the um, pursuit vehicles in the state patrol's fleet, if they were re being replaced at the correct mileage in order to minimize the long-term cost of operating their fleet. So I, I throw that as an example because, you know, for each of these other mandates we have, we're gonna be searching for, is there a racial equity issue that is associated with the purpose of that other mandate? And I um, think I like this example because I, I think it might uh, be an instance where we probably could have concluded there may not be a racial equity question on picking the mileage. Not that there aren't important racial equity issues related to the state patrol, but we needed to interface with that other mandate as, as the 5405 directs us to. Our third principle, JLARC staff will not exclude racial equity analysis from a study scope because of a perceived lack of data. And again, I, I, I would uh, assert that this really isn't different than our other approaches on other studies. We often get asked lots of very complicated questions by all of you. And sometimes it is challenging to give an au um, audit type of answer because of the challenges with data. And as um, uh, Eric Whitaker was alluding earlier, we've already been given a heads up about some of the challenges sometimes in finding disaggregated data that can help with racial equity analyses. But that said, um, that's not gonna preclude us from trying, right? And that I still can think, I still believe that sometimes that provides some really meaningful information to the legislature is when there isn't information to provide an answer, um, it's important for you to hear that. And sometimes that can provide some really helpful um, uh, ideas for proceeding that if you do want some of that evidence in the future for, for some answers or more information being available, then it is kind of a notice to the legislature that there might be some avenues you might want to pursue to make sure that information does become accessible or available. Our fourth principle, JLARC staff will prioritize using actual disaggregated data about the race of those affected to evaluate programs. And this one is really Keyly in um, a key basis of informing this principle was some of that preliminary research that um, Eric Whitaker was referring to about that being the gold standard to really have a good, firm, rigorous answer about the either distribution of resources or the um, availability or delivery of services that drills into racial categories of the recipients. And then our final principle, initially JLARC staff will prioritize evaluating whether quantifiable data varies by race and whether agencies are complying with equity related statutory direction. I think this is the, by starting in this area, this is where we're gonna most likely be able to add the, the most immediate value to helping inform the legislature to start. Um, and as uh, Rebecca had noted earlier, the evaluation of um, equity evaluation is continuing to evolve and, and we will be staying abreast of the nature of those research methods as they um, might uh, get to the point where more of the process related um, approaches that involve diversity, equity, inclusion um, may, may um, start getting more traction about how well we can evaluate using that, but probably quantifying um, results is gonna be our most useful first approach. So um, not seeing any other questions, I'll move on to next steps. Um, uh, we are nearly to October now. And so October and November, here's what we're gonna be working on in the office. I'm, I have a recruitment underway for some additional staff, including uh, we are seeking um, getting uh, an analyst with demography expertise on board, since I think that will be a key addition to our skill set in the office for analyzing this topic. Uh, we'll continue to develop and refine the approach for determining when an equi equity analysis will be included in the scope of the audits. And, and this is the area that we are especially finding there's, there is no easily accessible um, model to use since we're kind of on the cutting edge of this. So this is one where 
it's taking a little bit more time since we are needing to develop this approach ourselves and don't have a lot of established um, um, templates to use. In December, we'll give you another status update on, on how, this, um, how the process is moving along. Um, but we, we will have um, the ability to give you a preview into some of the first um, approaches in this area because we, do, we did add a, um, uh, all of you added to the work plan, um, a study that within the mandate of the study has a racial equity focus already. So that element of, of determining whether it's in the mandate's already settled. And that's uh, conducting a study on racial equity impacts of the pandemic in-person K-12 restrictions. And we are working on preparing the study questions for that that we can share in December. And then what we, our plans are is to come back in January with a final briefing report on the process that will um, get into more of the details about how we're going to determine when it's related to uh, a mandate and probably discuss some potential uh, differences in maybe some procedural issues before the, that we bring forth before the committee. Um, there probably will be some necessary um, tweaks to how we um, share study questions um, to make sure that we're being very transparent with how we're approaching this. And with that, that's what I had to cover in the slides, um, but I'd be happy to address any questions and um, I'm sure the chair might have some comments to offer as well. Um, thank you. Let me lead off um, with some commentary and then take the questions. Uh, in uh, my discussions with uh, Keenan and the staff, um, uh, I have uh, encouraged and um, taken the perspective that it is vital that we adopt a very credible and transparent process. And one of the key things that um, I think people jump to is looking at what will the process be for criteria within a study? And I wanna remind members that first is the criteria and having a very transparent and credible process that it, people can see how do we decide whether or not disparities exist that fall within the scope of the study. That is the first step. And that will be somewhat controversial as I think the state patrol example um, is a terrific one because people may say, well, obviously there are issues about state patrol and racial equity. Uh, first and foremost that comes to my mind is my seatmate has been championing and repeated uh, Representative Valdez hiring within state patrol. Significant disparity issues and racial equity issues, but it has nothing to do with car purchases. And so, but we can't just say that. We have to go through a process with these studies where it is documented what is in and outside the study so it is consistent from every, for every single study we do and very transparent to people. And everyone knows what the criteria is for whether or not we are proceeding to a study. What is the strength of evidence required to proceed? And then with, when we're doing a study, what is the strength of evidence that will be reported and relied on to show whether or not there are disparities and um, outcomes that are affected by race and other equity issues due to the program and what is the strength of evidence for that. And that will be very important for us to be able to consistently um, report and share. Um, so, that has been my goal. Um, I've, or, I'm very pleased with the extent of interviews. I've worked on similar projects with the Department of Health on their health impact reviews, which I think are considered 
very credible in terms of disparate impacts. And that is one of the many models that the staff has been using. So um, I just wanted to lay that out. I'm very pleased with the principles that have been adopted and the desire that we have clear criteria that is transparent to everyone. Um, Senator Hasegawa. Oh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I would like to thank Keenan and Eric and Rebecca and the JLARC staff for their due diligence on putting this plan together. Uh, you know, we really need the credibility and the objectivity of JLARC to help us identify and uh, repair some of the disparities that are embedded within our system. So I'm just very appreciative. And I also want to thank my colleagues, um, you all who voted for the bill. It went out almost unanimously out of the Senate. Had a little more problems in the House, but uh, the Senate being the wiser chamber saw fit to pass it almost unanimously. And so this progress, uh, I really appreciate. Uh, everything that Jay Lark is doing uh, with regard to the due diligence and putting a fine program together. Um, I especially appreciate items three and four uh, regarding the lack of data question because, you know, as we embark on this journey to try and bring more equity throughout all of our systems, the fundamental uh, tools that we'll need will probably not be there. The data that we need to do the the good analysis. Some of the institutions, as Keenan mentioned, like OSPI or DOC, have already started working on these areas and, and have a lot to teach, but uh, most agencies uh, will need more guidance from JLARC as it comes down. So I appreciate the point number three. Um, and the point number four is also has been a big issue on the disaggregated data and the need to um, differentiate within um, racial groups, actually, because there's huge disparities even within racial groups. So uh, appreciate all of that. I just have one thought about, uh, it's probably your standard operating procedure, but in, in trying to identify where those gaps are, where the disparities are, you may want to engage with um, agencies that have uh, the most insight into where those gaps may be, or even um, consult with the public or community-based organizations to also try and see are there gaps or disparities. But other than that, you know, I'm, I'm just very appreciative, Keenan and staff for uh, all your work on putting this together. Thank you. Uh, Keenan, do you want to comment on whether key interviews will are expected to be part of the process? Yeah, yes, very, very much so. And um, I, I think it, um, as you were noting, Senator, I don't, I, uh, there's a little bit of this that's, it's a new area of inquiry, but, um, you know, the more things change, more things change, the more they stay the same. That is a standard process. We consult with lots of the agencies and stakeholders on any study we do. So we're going to carry that tradition, Anna, and especially in this area. I think it's important to, to make sure there's some recognition of that. I, that probably points out to the, to the other thing that I just wanted to um, extend some appreciation to the committee is your patience as we move forward with this. I, I realize it's... Um, uh, Going a little slowly, um, I will be the first to admit I'm rarely accused of being fast, um, but this is something that we want to make sure is done right rather than fast, I think. So um, um, the development of it to make sure everybody understands how it proceeds, I think is going to be fundamental to ensuring that everybody uh, feels that it's as, a, as objective and nonpartisan as any of the other work we do here in front of JLARC. I thought I had seen another hand up. I thought it might've been Senator Rivers. Had you had your hand up, Senator? No. Just waving hello. Beautiful background you've got today. Um, any other questions or input? Not just questions, but input. All right. Um, 
In that case, um, thank you very much for the briefing. And, um, and again, if you have ideas, I know the staff is eager to hear them. Uh, so, uh, and especially if you're in your work, you um, uh, see other models that staff may not be aware of for incorporation, please share it. Uh, with that, we will then move to um, our item number three. Um, and um, we are four minutes ahead of schedule, which is unprecedented. Uh, and the item number three is review of the healthcare authority's budget structure. And let's just say, I think this is going to be a complicated subject. Uh, so, um, uh, Ryan and Rebecca are presenting, and we have agency staff um, available to assist with answering questions. Um, so please take it away. Hey. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I am still Rebecca Connolly, uh, and I'm joined by my colleague, Ryan McCord. We are staff to the committee and are presenting the preliminary report on our review of the healthcare authority's budget structure. The legislative auditor concluded that the complexity of the authority's accounting structure reflects service delivery, and it also helps to fulfill reporting requirements. The expenditure forecast work group, which includes the authority, the Office of Financial Management and legislative staff, lacks a formal structure that could improve the utility of and confidence in the uh, expenditure forecast. So the 2020 legislature directed JLARC to review the healthcare authorities budget and accounting structures. Our review focused on Medicaid, which is the largest part of the authorities budget. Medicaid provides healthcare coverage for eligible adults and children and that coverage includes both medical assistance and behavioral health. Medicaid is funded with state and federal dollars and state funds include the general fund, local funds and designated fees or taxes. And Medicaid has been part of the healthcare authority's budget since 2011. So our presentation today will have three parts. I'll start with a review of the authority's accounting structure. Ryan will then talk about uh, the budget development and what we learned from our review of other states, and we'll wrap it up with a discussion of the forecast work group. So with regard to the accounting structure, there are three key points that I'll cover today. First, we'll talk about how the detail supports the federal reporting, then how the complexity has uh, reflected the service delivery changes, and finally, go through how managed care affects the information that's available from the accounting structure uh, specifically. So when I say accounting structure, what I'm talking about is the system of codes that the authority uses to track expenditures. Each code provides a piece of information about the expenditure, and that might be the purpose, the fund source, or the federal match rate. There are some codes that the authority sets and then other codes such as uh, linking an expenditure to a legislative proviso, those are set by the Office of Financial Management. The authority uses combinations of all of those codes to provide the detail that is needed for the federal reporting. For example, these three code types, sub-sub-object, program index and cost objective, uh, they provide information about an expenditure's purpose, the uh, eligibility group that it, uh, it's related to, and the federal match rate. So when you combine codes within those code types, they identify expenditures in a way that's really critical for federal reporting. For example, these three codes in particular would indicate that the expenditures were for uh, the amount that the healthcare authority pays to a managed care organization on a monthly basis for adults who are eligible through Medicaid expansion with a 93% federal match rate in a particular time period. Changing any one of those codes changes perhaps your federal match rate or even the expenditure type entirely to something like a special payment for labor and delivery um, expenditures. 
So that is just one example of the complexity of how those are put together. And the accounting structure has become more complex as codes are added or changed to reflect service delivery. So to demonstrate, I'm going to focus on the three code types that I just discussed. And before medical assistance was transferred from DSHS, the authority had 142 codes within those three code types. In 2011, following the transfer of Medicaid medical assistance, the number of codes just for those three types, again, increased to 743. Following the Affordable Care Act in 2014, which expanded eligibility, there was another bump in the codes. And finally, in 2018, when behavioral health was transferred, again, from DSHS to the authority, the healthcare authority adopted the accounting structure that DSHS was using for behavioral health in full, and the number of unique codes jumped to over 1,300. Now, all that said, the structure will change entirely over the next year through the One Washington Project, which is replacing uh, the accounting structure for all agencies statewide. So last thing uh, we'll talk about on the accounting structure is how uh, managed care has uh, changed the amount of information available in the accounting system. Let's start with the fee for service, which is a more traditional way of paying for uh, Medicaid. And under fee for service, which covers about 17% of uh, the enrollees, the healthcare authority pays providers directly for the medical services that are provided. The accounting system captures the information about the authority's payments to those providers. So from the accounting structure, you can get information such as the total amount paid for inpatient hospitalizations. Under managed care though, which covers about 83% of the enrollees, the authority pays the managed care organizations a flat rate uh, each month for all services. And then the managed care organizations pay the providers for the services. The accounting structure records only the payment to the MCOs because that is what is the healthcare authority's expenditure. Now that said, the healthcare authority does have other systems that collect data about the services provided. And all of this is typical of uh, managed care systems, but it does mean that you're, there's less information available from the accounting structure about specific service costs. And now I'll turn it over to Ryan uh, and he will walk through um, the next portions of our presentation. Great, so next I'm going to talk about how the authority along with its uh, legislative and Office of Financial Management partners develops the Medicaid medical assistance budget. Oops. <laughs> Missed a few slides. All right, so uh, the budget is based on two major processes, managed care rate setting and expenditure forecasting. The medical assistance budget for the 1921 biennium was 19.6 billion. <laughs> Having some slide issues, I apologize. There we go. Uh, 19.6 billion was the total budget, and of that, 14.5 billion uh, was related to managed care, and that's about 74% uh, of the total. 16.7 billion, or 85%, was subject to the expenditure forecast. So some examples of expenditures that are not part of the forecast include program administration and certain hospital payments that are based on federal formulas. Managed care rates are developed each year to take effect the following year. Is there a question from Senator Mullet? Yeah, I was curious if that's okay, Mr. Chair, if I can, uh, how does that break down? Is there a way to break it down per 
person roughly i know like so there's a those are the total numbers like what is what does that end up being per person and what is the rough very like how much has it changed i guess over time do you have a sense of that ryan i know that's not exactly germane sure this presentation. Uh, I, i'm just trying to get a sense of how much volatility there is that these forecasts are trying to account for right so um there has been quite a change over time and and mostly increases i don't have the per person figures in front of me Be happy Recording to in progress. Get more specific numbers and how that's changed over time. Um, when you break down the forecast into its component parts, uh, their OFM is really looking at about 600 different combinations of service and caseload. And I'll get into that a bit more later. Uh, about 100 of those are what they consider large categories that they pay more attention to. Um, and within um, I would say the very largest categories, which are the payments to managed care organizations, tend to be more stable over time um, from year to year and biennium to biennium. However, uh, sort of for the, uh, the, the components that are a little smaller than that, there can be quite a lot of volatility. Um, some of that is just based on medical inflation. Some of that could be more based on any uh, policy or benefit design changes. So the, uh, the managed care rates, as I said, are developed each year and they take effect the following calendar year. The development of those rates starts in May and concludes in October. And for the expenditure forecast, the, uh, the first forecast informs the budget, uh, the, excuse me, the governor's budget. And that happens, uh, starts in about July and ends in November. And then the Second forecast informs the legislature's budgets. Uh, the new managed care rates are developed are incorporated into those forecasts. To develop those managed care rates, the estate contracts with an actuarial firm, Milliman, uh, and there are four basic steps that I'll go over to their process. So first, the actuaries collect medical service and use and cost data and that's maintained by the authority. They also collect financial information directly from the managed care organizations. Next, they compare the two data sets to ensure that they align. And in that stage, they also test and scrub the data to make sure uh, it's accurate. From that data, they develop trends, which are predictions of future costs. The actuaries meet regularly with authority, OFM, and legislative staff in that stage to discuss the assumptions that underlie the trends. And finally, the actuaries calculate the rates for different Medicaid populations and account for factors such as age, gender, and geographic location. It's worth noting that the uh, process of rate development is, is heavily regulated by the federal government, and the work also involves extensive professional judgment on the part of the actuaries. OFM, with significant input from the authority and legislative staff, develops the expenditure forecasts that inform the governor's and legislature's medical assistance budgets. And again, uh, there's four steps, basic steps to the process. Um, OFM staff first pull uh, expenditure data from the state accounting system and organize the data by service. Some examples of a service would be outpatient care or drugs, um, and they also organize it by caseload. So then using the caseload, 
OFM staff calculate the historical amount spent per person for each service and determine the most accurate trend line for those expenditures. They adjust the trends up or down for previously authorized changes to the program and benefits. Some examples there are uh, new managed care rates and updates to the uh, fee-for-service payment schedule that the authority uses. Once the forecast work group agrees on a final draft, is there a question from Senator Hasegawa? Mr. Chair, if I may. Please do. Yeah. Uh, thanks, yeah, I was going back a couple of slides and there, it says there's an independent actual error actuarial firm that actually develops the rates paid to the managed care organizations. So does that mean that our budget committees just take those, what the actuarial firm predicts and then that's what we budget for? Is that how that number is used? Yeah, so uh, federal rules do require that the uh, rates paid to managed care organizations be actuarial sound, and, and there's a specific definition for that. Um, so the actuaries must certify, and in Washington actually, um, like most states, uh, use an independent firm to do that. Uh, in terms of how that's incorporated into the final medical assistance appropriation, generally uh, the, the legislature does adopt for the maintenance level budget, the, uh, the forecast, which includes those uh, managed care rates. So um, the short answer is yes, uh, although of course the legislature has the authority um, final say in, in what the budget amounts are, um, but generally in, in the recent past at least, the legislature has just um, adopted those, those new rates, managed care rates through the appropriation process. So that's really interesting because all I ever hear about is that we're underfunding all that stuff. So thanks. So to just cover the final step in the process, uh, once the work group agrees on a final draft, excuse Mr. me. Mr. quick quick interruption, Ryan. I'm, I think uh, Representative Paulette, I'm not sure you rep saw uh, Representative Gaynor has this. Henry. No, I didn't. Uh, excuse me, Representative Gaynor, please go ahead. And thank you for letting me know when people's hands are up. And thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to follow up a little bit on Senator Hasegawa's uh, question because that is really the, the take that, I mean, the feedback that I've gotten. So when they're establishing rates, <clears throat> are these rates, are they negotiated or are they established that this is how much we will pay for for certain services? Uh, so th there is a, um, a work group process that, again, that involves the healthcare authority, OFM, and uh, the Milliman, or excuse me, and legislative staff from OPR and SCS. So those, uh, those fiscal legislative staff to participate. And uh, the Milliman actuaries meet with that work group throughout the year uh, to go over assumptions and what they call sort of dials, the things that, that can be changed based on sort of judgment of, of what the future is gonna look like. Uh, however, it, it, um, it really is the case that, that federal law says basically the actuaries have, have the last word um, on, on what those rates would be. Does, does that answer your question, Representative? Well, uh Somewhat, but I guess my the what I guess have understood is that the service is provided, but the reimbursement for that service does not necessarily it doesn't cover the cost the true cost of providing that service. So, is the actuarial making an assumption that we will continue to maybe increase the rates, but it's not necessarily tied to the true cost of the service? Or is that, yeah, that's why I'm saying, is it just a projection that they're making or is it a negotiated rate with, uh, and then incorporated into those projections of, of increased costs? Ryan, can I take a step? 
Yeah. I, I think if I'm, if I'm understanding it, um, the part of the actuary's process is to ask for additional information from the managed care organizations uh, about their costs. So they have the information that they are pulling from the uh, health care authority and from the budget system. But there also there is an opportunity for the managed care organizations to say, here's additional information that you may not have gleaned from the healthcare authority. Right. I don't know if there's more to say there. I would also add that it's the managed care organizations that are negotiating contracts with providers. Um, and so then based on the, those contracts and what they're paying, uh, they come back and say, you know, here's our expenditure data. Um, we, you know, we, we think we need this amount of money, but then the actuaries take a look at that. And, um, uh, and I guess someone, my other colleague who, who did a lot of more work on this just texted me and said that the, fundamentally the rates are, are not negotiated. They are, they're really um, set by an actuary. That, that does stand in contrast to the fee-for-service portion, uh, which is about, I believe, uh, 17% of enrollment. In that program, the state, uh, the authority maintains a fee payment schedule and pays providers directly based on that. Uh, and in those cases, um, th I think there is more negotiation with providers. However, I, I would really defer to um, the, the authority staff to, to answer that question a bit more. And I know there is um, a few folks on the line that, that could shed some more light on that. Hey, hey, Ryan, this is Katrina. Do you want us to comment now or should we wait until you conclude your presentation? You no, know, and uh, it might be very helpful to clarify right now. And uh, also, I'm sure because we're legislators, we're, we know that sometimes we are involved in setting rates and how does that factor in? Sure. So I just make a couple comments first. In terms of the rates that the actuaries are setting, they're setting the managed care rates. Those are the rates that HCA pays. And then the MCOs are the ones who are responsible for contracting directly with providers. You know, in some cases that may be a negotiated process between the managed care entity and the provider. In other cases, the managed care entity may have a sort of fee-for-service fee schedule fee they pay to providers. And that's what a provider receives when they agree to contract. So that piece between the MCOs and the providers is a sort of outside of the actual process in terms of the rates they are setting. In, ter in, in terms of the question about, you know, really whose cost is it covering? So the actuaries are looking at the data for what the MCOs pay out. So basically the MCOs cost. It is possible that what the MCOs pay may not always fully cover a provider's costs. And so I think, you know, Representative Hasegawa, to your point about you hear from some providers that the Medicaid rates do not fully cover their costs, that could be a portion of that disconnect. Um, but again, the actuaries are really focused on what the costs are for the managed care entity specifically. And that is information they sort of use to develop a, a cost-based rate um, that gets rebased every calendar year. And so the sort of process they use is to look at what cost information the MCOs have had from a, a prior period. And then we also make some adjustments based on if there were new program changes, if new facilities came online, um, if there were other sort of external impacts that wouldn't be picked up in historical data. And that is sort of all combined with trend and those things end up leading to the final rates that the, the actuary is certified. I don't know if that helps with some of the questions, but we're happy to help address any other um, pieces of clarity. Thank you and welcome to us in this new role, Katrina. Now, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, Katrina is the Deputy uh, Chief Financial Officer at the Healthcare Authority. Uh, so is there any other question, follow-up questions on that? Okay, so the um, so after this process, the forecast workgroup process happens. At that point, the OFM budget analysts and legislative fiscal staff translated it translate it into the legislative budget format. And uh, of course, you're familiar with that format. It shows how next biennium's costs would increase or decrease from the current appropriation if there were no new uh, policy proposals. So as, as I mentioned before, the legislature's medical assistance appropriation generally reflects that amount from the forecast. 
and then of course up, adjusted up or down for any of your new uh, policy proposals. The legislature directed us to compare the authority's budget structure to those from other states of a similar size, and we selected six states. One finding uh, from our comparisons is that legislative staff in Washington have more opportunities to provide input uh, during the actuary rate development and expenditure forecasting compared to, to the other uh, states we looked at. And it was really only legislative staff in Virginia that had a comparable level of involvement. So I'm gonna move on to discussing the structure and process of the forecast work group. The group has about 15 members, again, representing OFM, the authority and the legislature, legislative staff. And they meet twicely throughout much of the year to complete the forecasts. The work group uh, uses organized processes to produce the forecasts. The uh, staff at OFM, the, the expert forecasting staff who do most of the technical work have significant expertise and experience in that field. And they repeat the same processes for each forecast cycle. The forecast is based on updated caseload estimates and recent actual expenditures. The work group members often want to use the most recent uh, expenditure data possible, so they may be reviewing and updating that data throughout the cycle of the forecast. The desire to use that recent data and the size and complexity of the medical assistance program means a heavy workload, especially towards the end of the forecast cycle. The work group members from the different organizations that are part of the work group have different understandings of the purpose of the forecast. All three use the forecast to support the governor's and legislature's budgets. OFM budget analysts and legislative fiscal staff also use the forecast process to understand what is driving changes in costs and trends. They use it to monitor the authority's expenditures against their budget as well. And in addition, legislative fiscal staff use the process to identify and discuss issues with the authority's accounting and program management. Authority staff report that they do not use the forecast process for those other purposes, but um, the authority does have multiple robust processes we found to accomplish those purposes. It's just that they don't rely on the forecast for those. Workgroup members and the legislature have called for evaluations and changes to the workgroup. For example, in 2003, the work group asked the Washington State Institute for Public Policy to evaluate and recommend changes. WISIP recommended that the work group adopt a charter that included clearly defined roles of members, a process for prioritizing requests for analysis, and a documented quality assurance program. At the time of the report, it was DSHS, not the Healthcare Authority that was responsible for the Medicaid program and the expenditure forecast. In 2016, the legislature transferred responsibility for the forecast from the authority to OFM. Prior to that transfer, legislative staff had expressed concerns about the authority's transparency and inability to fully answer questions about forecast assumptions and processes. See, there's a hand up. Yep. Yes, Senator Mullet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Ryan, it looks like, you know, based on your previous slides, like 80, 83% is, is pretty much set by Milliman's actuarial analysis in the managed care space. So how much volatility are we seeing, I guess, in the remaining 17% when we say this is off, like how much is it off by? And we have a sense of that because it seems like we're now trying all this effort, am I correct in thinking most of this effort is trying to predict that 17% that isn't falling in the managed care space, or is it trying to predict 
what Milliman's going to come back with for their actuarial numbers? Yeah, it, it's both. Uh, so you're right that um, there can be more volatility in that 17% that's not part of managed care. However, the, um, the forecast work group does uh, attempt to or does forecast the uh, future managed care expenditures. Um, it, gets, it gets pretty technical, and I know there's some OFM forecasting staff on the line um, that know it in and out, but I, I guess the he headline summary is that there are, um, it, it's not just as simple as rates times caseload for those uh, managed care expenditures in the future. They're actually forecasting them because there are certain contractual uh, uh, between um, HCA, the, health, the healthcare authority, and the managed care organizations. There's profits uh, and withholds. There's other things going on that actually change the expenditures. So it's not just a simple rate. And in recent years, that's actually increased. Uh, so there is, uh, especially in recent years, been more um, change in volatil volatility, even in those managed care rates. As I mentioned before, though, those really large um, components, for example, the managed care rates for the ACA expansion adults is in the billions every year. Um, and that tends to stay more stable, sort of the law of large numbers there. So I guess, Ryan, if I can ask a follow up, Mr. Chair, back when we, I remember when we did this transfer from HCA to OFM in 2016, I think there was like a certain level of frustration. It was hard on the Ways and Means Committee to properly budget what the HCA expenses were gonna actually be. You know, Ryan, if when we did that change was, which area were we off in and trying to predict? Were we off in predicting the managed care rates or were we off in predicting the remaining 17% or were we just, were we off everywhere? I'm talking about pre-2016 before OFM took it over. So, the volatility that led to that change, I guess. Right, there were, um, there were a couple of specific instances that led to um, components of the forecast being off. Um, I'm trying to remember <laughs> exactly what they were, but um, the, there, there was some uh, volatility involving changes in what, what was carved in and carved out of managed care. And they, uh, there were some, for example, drugs uh, have been a big part of that. That's something that has actually moved in and out of managed care. So sometimes um, it's been part of those rates. Other times the state has, has paid for those costs directly outside of managed care. And so there have been instances where uh, they had a hard time predicting what that would look like, those uh, drug costs in the future. And um, so there was more volatility leading up to that, um, that 2016 shift. Previously, I, I, our understanding is that uh, the WISIP report in 2003, there was a pretty large variation between the forecast and actual expenditures that, uh, that led to that evaluation. Um, of course, that was almost 20 years ago, but there have been sort of periodic variations between what the forecast found and, um, and the actual expenditures, not necessarily reflected in big variations for the entire, you know, uh, $18 billion forecast, but the um, certain components of it, there was, there could be variation. Uh, Ryan, um, you know, federal government Center for Medicaid um, has flows down requirements for states and HCA, which then flow down to the accountable communities of health, to the, oper the providers, um, excuse me, the MCOs and then the providers, um, specific efforts to reduce Medicaid costs. You know, an effort that should reduce emergency room utilization, for example. Um, how accurate have been the predictions uh, forecasts for whether or not those um, incentives have actually reduced costs 
and are we rigorously examining those and having a feedback loop to whether or not they work? The, we, we did touch on the accountable communities of health and alternative payment models, the you know, value-based repayment that um, the authority is moving towards. I, um, it, we, as we scoped our study, we, we did sort of, um, that was a bit outside of our scope. So we didn't look specifically into what the um, sort of outcomes of those programs uh, are so far. I know there's been there's been a sort of a big shift in uh, in towards those kind of payment models, uh, and there've been we did look briefly at some of the um, information that the accountable communities of health specifically report in implementing their their goals and their plans, um, and they they do report a lot of information, but um, I would we could get back to you with a bit more information that we gathered. Um, or we could also, I'm sure that um, some of the folks from HCA might be able to shed a bit more light on the, um, the status and the sort of success of, of those efforts. I, I'd appreciate that we see that because I think a fundamental question that Senator Mullet has begun as looking at for our purposes as JLARC is, um, you know, what's the quality of the forecasting? And a, f a key component is um, forecasting the success of efforts that are supposed to reduce cost. And we need to know if those are working and um, what the outcomes are, not just on reducing costs, but you know, it doesn't help if you reduce cost by reducing access to behavioral health. Um, it, we have to look at both sides of the outcomes. Senator Wilson. Thank you. Um... I ha I'm following up on what you just said, uh, Representative Paulette. Uh, if you look back at uh, slide number 17, if we're trying to understand um, or have more confidence in this uh, forecast, it, it I guess looking at this slide, how the healthcare authority says that that's not part of their job is not to understand cost drivers and trends or to monitor expenditures. Um, I think that's really concerning here. If they're not understanding these cost drivers, um, then they're not monitoring their own internal expenditures and basing that on what they know based on the forecast. So, I'm hoping that this will, I guess, open their eyes to that and see what kind of, because I, I know that there's no, there's a lack of a formal structure here. So I'm hoping that they look at this and see that there needs to be a formal structure and include understanding cost drivers and trends and monitoring expenditures. I guess that wasn't a question, that was a statement. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will point out, um, and I, I might have forgotten to say this in the slide, but uh, HCA does have pretty robust processes when we looked at their federal reporting, their own internal uh, management reporting, their fiscal tracking to accomplish those purposes. Our point here, and it, it may not have come across well in the slide, is that they're, they're just not using that forecast work group process to, just to, to track those things. They have their own um, internal management reports that uh, may use different uh, breakdowns of caseloads, for instance, uh, in a different way that the forecast does it that they find more useful for their management. So I, I didn't mean to uh, imply that they're not doing that those things. And in fact, um, those processes that we did review that the authority is doing, um, it, they, they did seem, um, they're certainly complying with all the federal requirements, which are reporting, which is extensive. And uh, there's a lot of internal um, processes to, mm -hmm. to monitor costs. So I, I apologize if I misspoke there. Okay. 
Yes, we did look, and there is a monthly process that they are take. They are comparing actual and forecasted expenditures to their uh, spending plan that's filed with OFM, and keeping track of what are the cost drivers, what is happening, and there are also a number of reports uh, that are due from the managed care organizations and others reporting on expenditures and um, so that they are aware of service usage and uh, factors that will drive future costs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Senator Rivers. You're muted, Senator Rivers. Great question. I'll never get used to this. Thank you so much, Chair Paulette. And thank you both to Ryan and Rebecca for this, um, the work done thus far on this issue. My question is, we have several reports that we're waiting from, from the HCA that, that deal um, precisely with cost drivers and we've not gotten any of them yet. So, Timeliness to me is an issue, and, and I'll be specific. Uh, uh, th if you think about um, pharmaceutical rebates uh, as a cost, well, as a as a potential uh, revenue source for the state, we you know think like frequent flyer miles. The state's buying the airline ticket but the MCO collects all the frequent flyer miles, which is what ha is happening with the rebates. So in terms of using this information to capture savings and, um, and to really understand where the, the cost drivers are, where the sort of black boxes are, um, I am hopeful that someone with the HCA who's watching right now will, uh, will, um, carry the message back that we're waiting and we want to work with the HCA because the more money we save, the more lives we can cover, um, the greater maybe we can increase our Medicaid rates, address accessibility issues and uh, suppress, the, um, suppress the number of people going to the ER as their primary care provider. Um, so there's really, I'm not really sure there's a question in there. It's just more um, the idea that there are so many unknowns. And while you have uncovered a great many, there are still a lot. And, um, and uh, I am hopeful that the HCA takes your information to heart and the comments made by legislators during this presentation. Um. I want to make sure we get through this presentation. So let's <laughs> return to where we were in the slides. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, oh, we were past 17. We were on 18, <laughs> going to 19, oh, I believe. Oh. No, we went but too far. Thank you, Rebecca. Make sure I can go to the next one. All right. So I think I covered that slide. And so uh, this is actually the second to last slide. Uh, we, we found that the work group does not have a written charter or bylaws. In contrast to the uh, Caseload Forecast Council and the Economic and Revenue Forecast Council, those are two other entities, of course, that also have a large role in state budgeting. And in those cases, those entity structures are written down in statute. And then, as I mentioned uh, on the last slide, WISIP recommended formalizing the, this work group structure and process with a written charter. And our research into academic literature, we found that um, a structured process can build confidence and acceptance in the forecast among the people who rely on it. So the legislative auditor makes one recommendation here. OFM should lead the work group in developing a charter that specifies its purposes, structure, and decision-making protocols. Some elements of the charter should include the purposes and the intended customers of the forecast, 
detailed roles and responsibilities of each member, protocols uh, such as the level of agreement necessary to finalize the decision and how inquiries and requests for analysis will be prioritized, rules for settling disagreements, um, how assumptions are documented and communicated to, to intended customers, including the legislature, and uh, quality assurance mechanisms and, and feedback mechanisms. And we recommend that OFM implement this recommendation by December 31st, 2022. Um, so one of my concerns when I read the recommendation initially was that it didn't seem to address the need for feedback mechanism. And you're saying that this basically in the structure, you're saying that's, it should fit in. Um, yes. And um, uh, I would just urge that you might want to clarify that in the final report and in presentations. I'm hopeful that this is a presentation that will be made in work sessions to the healthcare committees um, as well as uh, others. And um, it, I think it would benefit from making it very clear that your discussion about the need for feedback would be explicitly met here. And we do, I, I know in the um, more detailed recommendation, we do uh, specifically identify making sure that the work group and OFM specifically is, is going back and, uh, and comparing previous forecasts to what actually happened. They do that um, to some extent, but there's no sort of timeline or, or formal process for doing that. So I know that's one of the, the feedback uh, mechanisms, and mechanisms that we envision, but um, your point is absolutely well taken that uh, call it clarifying that that feedback is is an essential part of that. Um, we will we will incorporate that. Are there additional committee questions or feedback for the preliminary preliminary report? Not seeing any hands up, um, and. Um, when we do adopt a final report, I want to note that it's our practice now that the executive committee will send a letter to the relevant committee chairs and ranking members, um, transmitting the report to them and urging them uh, to uh, consider it and in this case, perhaps have a work session for members. Any last questions or thoughts from any members? I want to thank you so much for uh, a really uh, informative presentation and work done on the report for all of the staff. And um, I was joking about being complex. This is indeed a complex area. And um, thank you for bearing with us with all our questions. Of course. Thank you. All right. We are a bit behind schedule. Um, uh, let's go to immediately to hear from uh, Jennifer and Aaron on the impact fee deferral program. Let's jump in. All right. They can raise their hands, stretch themselves while we begin, but let's get going. Great, thank you. Good morning, Chair Paulette, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Salser, and I'm joined by my colleague, Erin Cavan, and we are staff to the committee. And we are here to present our preliminary report on impact fee deferral programs. The legislative auditor conclusion for this report is that impact fee deferrals have been infrequent and concentrated in five local governments with few adverse effects. And the financial benefit of deferrals could increase if market conditions change in the future. So impact fees are one-time charges. Developers pay on new construction. And these fees typically help pay for new or expanded public facilities that will serve the new development. Builders uh, usually pay these fees early in the process, typically when they, they pick up their building permits. 
And under the Growth Management Act, uh, local governments are authorized to impose up to four different types of impact fees. And that includes fees for schools, parks, transportation, and fire. We have a brief description on the slide as to uh, what those fees go for. And the amount of the fees do vary across jurisdictions. And that's based on the, the need and the conditions of, of the community. So in 2015, the legislature required counties, cities, and towns that impose impact fees to adopt a deferral system for the collection of those fees, uh, specifically for new single family residential construction. And the law gave local governments that did not already have a deferral program in place uh, until September 1st of 2016 to, to implement one. And the law also directed us to review the implementation and use of deferrals, um, as well as whether the deferrals had an effect on local governments, uh, which will be the focus of our, our presentation today. So under the deferral law, uh, local governments must allow builders seeking a deferral to delay the payment of the fees to either final inspection, certificate of occupancy, or closing of the first sale of the property. Uh, the law does require builders to record a lien against the property in favor of the local government in the amount of the deferred fees. And those deferred fees are determined uh, by the impact fees that are in effect at the time uh, when the builder actually applies for the deferral. So essentially the impact fees or the deferred fees won't increase uh, during the deferral period. Uh, the law also did include a grandfathering clause. So these requirements uh, do not apply to local governments that are already had a pre-existing deferral program uh, prior to really the passage of this law or April of 2015. Our presentation has two parts today. I will discuss the implementation of deferral programs and their use, and then Aaron will discuss the financial impacts of deferrals to local governments and builders. For our review, uh, we first determine which local governments collect impact fees, uh, because as I stated by law, those that collect impact fees are required to have a deferral program in place. And so we were able to identify 107 local governments that actually collect impact fees. And we found 98 of that 107 uh, have an, a deferral program in place. 18 of those 98 had a pre-existing deferral program, as I've, I've mentioned before and then 80 implemented one as a result of the 2015 law. And we identified nine local governments that have uh, not yet implemented a program. So the nine local governments that we identified that don't currently have a deferral program are listed here uh, on the left-hand side and are represented by the red dots on the map. And we did reach out to the mayors and the city attorneys for these nine cities to determine the status of their deferral programs. And we ended up receiving uh, responses back from four of the nine. And that included Deer Park, uh, which confirmed that they don't have a deferral program. And then Everson, Granite Falls and Maple Valley reported that they were in the process of implementing one. So this brings us to our first legislative auditor recommendation, and that is the, the cities without a deferral program should pass an ordinance to adopt and maintain an impact fee deferral program for single family residential construction as required by statute. So in addition to some of the statutory requirements I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the law provided local governments with some options in developing their deferral programs. So the first option was when to collect the deferred fees. Uh, while the local governments are required to delay the payment of fees, statute did leave it up to them as to whether to collect the fees at either final inspection, certificate of occupancy, or at the first sale of the property. So based on our review, most local governments chose to collect deferred fees at final inspection. Uh, another decision that was left up to local governments was whether to charge administrative fees to builders who use deferrals. And we found that most local governments uh, choose to charge uh, an administrative fee. And then the third decision uh, was whether to limit the number of deferrals a builder uh, could request. Uh, the law allows builders uh, to defer impact fees on 20 building permits per year. 
uh, but local governments could elect to defer more than 20 uh, for an applicant if they wanted to. And our review found that actually most local governments chose to stick with the statutory limit of 20. So next we'll move on to uh, deferral use. Uh, we ended up collecting data on deferrals for 2018 and 2019 and found that while 98 local governments have a deferral program, uh, deferrals were requested and issued in 22 of these, uh, which are depicted on our map here. And these 22 local governments uh, reported uh, that they issued 3,741 deferrals. And the legislature asked us to break these deferrals down by the type of impact fee uh, that was deferred, uh, which we've done here on, on this slide. So of the 3,741 deferrals, 91% uh, of these were requested and issued by Ferndale, Le Center, Redmond, Richfield, and Kitsap County. And we ended up interviewing the staff at these local governments and learned that their deferral uh, programs have a few things in common. And this includes that they don't require a lien to be recorded in order to defer impact fees. They don't charge administrative fees, so it's essentially free to use the deferral. And they don't require additional paperwork to be filled out or have additional steps uh, to the application process. Oops. We also looked at the number of permits with deferred impact fees uh, compared to the total number of building permits issued for single family residential construction and found that deferral use has been infrequent and unrelated to permit activity. So we looked at permit data and estimated that builders requested deferrals on about 5% of all uh, permits issued for single family homes um, by the local governments that actually have a deferral program in place. And to highlight this, um, our graph here shows the top five local governments that issued the most building permits in 2018 and 2019. So as you can see, only Pierce County issued one permit out of 3,098 that had impact fees deferred on it. This is in comparison to the five local governments that issued the most deferrals. Um, as you can see here together, uh, they issued only 8% of single family building permits. At the legislature's direction, uh, we reviewed the number of deferrals that were not fully or timely paid. And local governments report that 99% uh, of deferrals were repaid on time. Uh, specifically, that's three of the 3,741 deferrals issued in 2018 and 2019 were not paid on time or in full. And in terms of what that represents monetarily, uh, during this time, we estimate that local governments with deferral programs collected $323 million in impact fees and issued deferrals for $11 million of that. And of the $11 million, uh, $13,000 was not paid on time or in full. Stakeholders that we interviewed reported that deferrals have not caused delays in capital improvement planning or construction. Uh, to ensure that deferrals are fully and timely paid, local governments report that they have implemented controls over the tracking and collection of deferred impact fees. And one of these is that typically uh, the deferred fees must be paid before the local government will schedule a final inspection or issue a certificate of occupancy. As Jennifer mentioned, local governments must require builders to record a lien against the property in the amount of the deferred impact fees, unless they establish their programs uh, prior to the state law. Stakeholders report uh, that this was intended to ensure that fees were paid. However, the lien may be unnecessary or problematic. Uh, so the lien may deter builders from requesting a deferral. Uh, the lien may require extra time and resources to process, record, and track. Uh, the lien may complicate or delay construction financing. And the lien may take priority over the mortgage lien in a foreclosure proceeding. Uh, so statute requires that the deferral lien be subordinate to a mortgage lien. So that is in the case of a foreclosure, uh, the mortgage lender would be paid first. However, uh, the way that this works in practice is that typically a deferral recipient has to record the lien before obtaining mortgage financing, which gives the mortgage lender a lower priority than the local government. And this is an obstacle to traditional construction financing. Uh, finally, the lien may delay sale of the property as well. This brings us to the second legislative auditor recommendation. 
Uh, the legislature should continue whether liens are a necessary tool to ensure that deferred fees are paid. As Jennifer noted, most deferrals are issued by local governments that do not require liens. Uh, the liens may discourage use of the programs. Local governments have implemented other controls to ensure fee collection, and there have been few deferrals that were not fully and timely paid. We also examined how deferrals affect the finances of home building. Uh, the primary financial benefit of deferrals uh, is that builders do not have to pay impact fees up front, either through a loan or out of pocket. And so the amount of the benefit of uh, uh, deferring depends on four major factors. The amount of the impact fees, interest rates on construction loans, uh, the deferral period, that is how long uh, builders would defer fees for, and then administrative or lien fees. And JLARC staff created a model uh, that shows the financial benefit um, and how it changes uh, as these four variables change for each of the 98 local governments with a deferral program. And the model includes these four variables. The model does not include additional costs uh, incurred by builders, such as staff time or legal costs that could reduce the financial benefit of deferring impact fees. JLRC's model predicts that builders benefit from deferring impact fees in more cities and counties when interest rates and deferral periods increase. Uh, so to show you what this looks like, uh, here we have uh, uh, the results of the model. Uh, the chart here illustrates the predicted net benefit or loss from deferring fees in each of the 98 local governments. So each circle on this chart represents one of those local governments. And circles on the right side of the graph, uh, right of the break-even point of zero dollars, uh, in those local governments, deferring fees may provide at least some benefit. And then, then circles to the left of that zero dollar line, uh, the costs of using the deferral outweigh the benefit. And so in this calculation, if we assume a 4.25% interest rate and a nine month deferral period, the model predicts at least some financial benefit if uh, builders deferred fees in 63 local governments. Now, in contrast, if we assume a 10% interest rate and an 18 month deferral period, the model predicts that there would be a financial benefit to builders in 94 local governments. And as you can see, the, the benefit is also much higher than in the, in the previous model. Um, in today's market, interest rates and deferral periods are more like the first version uh, in which the model predicts that costs exceed benefits in many places. Uh, but of course, in the future, interest rates may rise uh, and deferral periods may increase. And so the financial benefit of deferrals could increase if market conditions change. We created an interactive version of this model in Tableau uh, that's linked through the report where you can calculate the estimated savings for each local government with a deferral program. Rep Barkat, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the previous slide, um, you changed the interest rate and the deferral period. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of whether one had a greater impact than the other? I mean, if you went from uh, four and a quarter in nine months to four and a quarter percent in 18 months, uh, would that be um, more beneficial than it would be if it were 10% uh, nine months, 10% 18 months? Yeah, you see what I'm getting at? Um, I believe so. Off, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, Jennifer, do you know? Yeah, so it, essentially that's sort of what we model. And I think Erin is gonna show us the, or the interactive calculator we put together so folks could play around with this. But um, essentially we, we looked at what today's market conditions were and through talking to lenders and builders, they said, look, money is, is pretty uh, cheap to borrow right now. It's about 4.25%. And then homes are selling really quickly. So in the, the first graph here, you can see that the, the there's a lot of cluster around sort of like the break even line. Um, whereas we also wanted to, we were told that, you know, if conditions change, so if the interest rates start to increase or the, the housing market stalls and homes aren't selling as quickly, um, either of those, either the, the interest rate or the homes not selling as quickly does impact the, the benefit. So if you put into our interactive calculator, I think the example you just gave was 10% at nine months, there still is, going. yeah, you'll see a, a, an increased benefit there as well. So it's, it's four factors that sort of influence that. And I think what we found was the two key ones that are kind of have the biggest impact are the interest rates and the, the deferral period. It's just, it's very difficult for me when you change two factors 
and then compared the two. Um, yeah, we, we can we can easily you, show you. Can't you can't tell which one had the bigger effect. Yeah, we, we can run some other ones for you, Representative. That that'd be really easy to do because we built a model to do it, so that'd be fast. Yeah, we'd be happy to. And and also just to note the uh, the interest rate compounds over the term of the deferral, so the those effects also interact. Um, all right, so the interactive version. This is a, a screenshot of what this looks like if you if you uh, use the model. Um, so you choose the local government and you can enter in the interest rate that you want to see and then the months of deferral that you want to see. And then it will show you, depending on the local government, the amount of impact fees collected, uh, the financing costs, uh, and then the total impact fees, um, and then the net savings in the end. And then all the local governments uh, are at the top there represented by those circles. Uh, the black circles are the ones where there's a predicted benefit. The red circles are the ones where there's a predicted uh, cost. And then the, the local government that you're looking at is highlighted in yellow up there. So for example, here, the calculator is showing uh, the results for Kitsap County, uh, which has issued the most deferrals of any of the local governments. And so here, if we assume a 4.25% interest rate and a nine month deferral period, which we understand is uh, the current uh, typical uh, amount, uh, the predicted savings is about $89 per single family home. Uh, finally, we want to note a data collection requirement. Uh, the legislature directed that uh, the Department of Commerce collect and report information about the number of deferrals requested, issued, and not paid on time or in full. However, since deferrals are not widely used and there have been few issues for local governments, ongoing monitoring by commerce may be unnecessary. And this brings us to our third recommendation. The legislature should either repeal commerce's data collection or identify which measures commerce should collect that would be helpful for evaluating program use. And that would include administrative costs, the amount of money deferred, in addition to just the number deferred, and the amount not paid on time or in full. So as a reminder, here are the legislative auditor's recommendations. Uh, cities should adopt uh, required deferral programs. The legislature should consider the necessity of the lien requirement and the legislature should repeal or modify commerce's data collection. This concludes our preliminary report. We will present our proposed final report in December and our contact information is here. And I believe a representative uh, from the Department of Commerce is here as well. Okay. Rep Orcott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the things that, that uh, kind of went up as a red flag is you're comparing um, the number of deferrals uh, by a city versus um, those by a county. And looking at Clark County, I think you said there were 3,800 permits and there were no deferrals, while two cities in Clark County had a large number of deferrals. And so I'm wondering if um, that's a factor of, you know, who is doing the permits, whether it be an individual homeowner permitting for a single home uh, out in the county, or if it's a developer that's, uh, you know, permitting for 20 or 30 homes within a city, if that is having an impact on the request for deferrals, simply because a contractor or a developer would be used to this and know um, what's coming and be prepared to ask for a deferral while somebody who just maybe moved into the state and wants to build their own home out in the county may not be aware. How, how much of a factor is that in the request for deferrals? So we asked uh, cities and counties that have deferral programs so what was driving the number of deferrals because there, there are these five city, four cities in one county where it's being used a lot. And so we asked you know, who's building these homes? Is it the large, you know, DR Horton, the home builders sort of doing the, the development or is it more of the spec home builders? And what they had said is over time, specifically, at least in these, these five areas, it has changed from the individual that was, you know, bought property and wanted to build a home on that property. And it had started to transition to the, the larger developments, the, the bigger developments where somebody, a uh, professional builder is coming in and building multiple homes uh, on a, a per plat basis. So that was what we were told that on um, how that was impacting where deferrals were being requested and how many were being requested. 
Senator Hasegawa. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. So I, I'm trying to figure out the purpose of this audit. Was it directed by the legislature for this specific pur purpose that you investigated? Because in looking back at the original bill that created this um, deferral to begin with, it had three legislative intents. So is that more the jurisdiction of the Citizens Commission on Performance Measurement of Tax Preferences, or is that something that JLARC may have or should have incorporated into this particular report? Uh, because you know things like um, reconsidering whether a lien is appropriate doesn't seem to fulfill the intent of the bill itself. And I guess, can, can you clarify which intent? Um... Well, the 5923 as passed by the legislature declared three intents to ensure that adequate facilities are available to serve new growth and management, to promote orderly growth and development by establishing standards by which counties, cities and towns may require by ordinance that new growth and development pay a proportionate share of the cost of new facilities needed to serve new growth and development, and to ensure that impact fees are imposed through established procedures and criteria so that specific developments do not pay arbitrary fees or duplicative fees for that same impact. So uh, I was just wondering if it, it seems non sequitur with the intent of the code to recommend things like reconsidering whether or not a lien is necessary. Yeah, so we followed our scope, which is kind of closer to the, the end of, of the, the bill. And that was really to look at sort of the number of deferrals, where they're being used, how they're being used, how they're being implemented. And one of the things that actually came up during uh, our conversations with cities and builders was this, this issue around the lien. And, and even lenders were, were saying, you know, this could potentially be problematic. We were we were wondering, we thought deferrals would be more widely used. Uh, we were, you know, when we found that they were being used in five local governments, we were curious as, you know, this, this seemed to be really um, popular when this passed in 2015. So we, we went to look as to well, why, why isn't it being more widely used? And one of the things that we found was that the lien might be acting as a barrier for some people using the, the who want to use the deferral. Uh, we heard this from, from several stakeholders. So one of the things that we thought would, and it totally, that's why we left it up to the legislature. It's whether or not, because it would take um, legislative action to, to change that. But uh, the, def the lien seems to be these, you know, the deferrals are being used in jurisdictions where there are no liens. Um, and that seems to be a commonality and which led us to this uh, particular recommendation. Yeah, one other thing I'd like to point out is that the title of the bill is to promote economic recovery in the construction industry. And it seems like construction industry really has recovered a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and maybe that might have been a recommendation uh, by Jay Lark that this is no longer necessary. But I was, or at least make it voluntary upon the jur sub jurisdictions, whether or not rather than making it mandatory for them to impose a deferral program. So um, I was just wondering if that's within the mission of Jay Lark or is that more within the mission of the Citizens Commission? Um, that Chair Kampaski, you want to address that? I mean, uh, Auditor Kampaski. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And um, one observation I wanted to uh, make sure I pointed out to you, Senator, is uh, um, uh, some of those intent statements there, um, I know this sounds a little nerdy, but um, recall that um, there's a broader bill about impact fees in general. And some of those intent statements are about the, the general impact fees. Our scope was specifically on the deferral program. So whether impact fees um, got into helping with economic development and building or hindered it or how that's kept up with construction issues, that, that's not really what we were at task with, with looking at was the deferral program specifically. Thank you. 
And um, uh, this isn't technically a tax preference review, um, right? Um, yeah, so that, that's, it, that's correct. They're reviewing correct. it as They're... a JLARC report. Yeah, um, yeah. With that said, I do believe there might be some opportunity for it. the House Local Government Committee, I think might be interested in a hearing workshop on session on this and considering the recommendations and uh, we'll share it with the chair of the Senate committee. Um, with that, I'd like to make sure we have time to move to our final agenda item. We're a little bit behind and kind of ask people to try to bear with us and um, we may go a little bit over here to look at the 2022 tax preference reviews. Okay. Okay. Um, good uh, morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Are you able to see the uh, study slides? Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm uh, Pete Van Morsel. I'm with uh, Dana Lynn this morning, and together we'll be presenting the uh, 2022 tax preference review study questions. Uh, just as a reminder, these are proposed study questions. These are unlike the previous two uh, preliminary report presentations you've heard where we, um, where um, the results of JLARC staff work were presented. These are uh, a discussion of upcoming reviews of tax preference for commute trip reduction programs, dairy, fruit and vegetable and seafood processors and nonprofit hospitals. And we'll be, um, presenting our preliminary report for these studies in July of 2022. So moving on to the first of these study questions. This is a uh, set of questions for the commute trip reduction tax preferences that are intended to encourage the use of commute alternatives. These are tax credits for employers that give financial incentives to employees to use commute alternatives. And specifically, they're uh, business and occupation tax and public utility tax credits that are uh, able to be claimed in the amount of 50% of the financial incentives that employers provide their employees to use these commute alternatives. Businesses must apply for the credit each year. And importantly, they do not have to have a CTR program um, pursuant to the Washington Clean Air Act and the CTR law in order to apply for these tax credits. The credits are subject to several caps, including a per employee cap per year, a per employer cap, and an overall statewide cap. Um, any claims above that uh, $2.75 million per year must be prorated by the Department of Revenue. The preferences were last extended in 2015. At that time, the legislature moved the expiration date out to 2024 and added a tax preference performance statement. And in doing so, the legislature implemented the recommendation of um, JLARC's review last time the preferences were reviewed in 2012, at which time the legislative auditor recommended that the preferences be reviewed and clarified. The performance statement states three objectives for the preferences, namely that they're intended to reduce traffic congestion, automobile related air pollution and energy use. And the performance statement also includes a condition that if the review finds that the percentage of Washingtonians using commute alternatives is increasing, then the legislative auditor is to recommend extending the preferences. Given that background, our study will address four questions. The first of these is how many employers have CTR programs? How many claim the tax credits? And how many employees do they cover? We'll estimate the value of the tax credits and compare this to the amount of financial incentives that employers provide their employees. We'll also ask whether CTR programs have contributed to reductions in congestion, air pollution, and energy use, as well as the extent to which these uh, reductions can be attributed to the tax credits. And finally, we'll ask um, and investigate the percentage of Washingtonians that use commute alternatives and compare that change to the level in 2015. Uh, that concludes the study questions for this set of preferences. Um, this slide shows the contact information for the study team. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any about this preference or else I'll hand it off to Dana. Anyone have any questions about this preference? 
Okay. Let's go to the next one. Dana, please. Thank, Thank you. Pete. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Dana Lynn, staff with the committee. The next preference review we'll talk about is a series of B&O tax preferences for food processors. Uh, this review will include six preferences with the stated intent to create and retain jobs and to continue tax relief for Washington's food processing industry. The tax preferences that we'll review include uh, preferences specifically for the fruit and vegetable processing industry, seafood product processors, and dairy product processors. And uh, the first batch of them is a series of B&O tax exemptions or deductions uh, for processors and for certain sales in these three industries. These preferences are currently in effect. They've been uh, extended a couple of times through the years by the legislature. Uh, and the preferences are now scheduled to expire July 1st, 2025. At that time, uh, the preferences will transition to three preferential rates at a 0.138% rate. That's uh, compared to the regular manufacturing rate of 0.484 and also a wholesaling rate at the same rate. Uh, that transition takes effect July 1st, 2025. Uh, we note that the preferential rate uh, for dairy products does expire in January of 2036. However, the preferential rate for both seafood processors and fruit and vegetable has no statutory expiration date. The legislature last extended these preferences in 2015. Uh, JLARC staff last reviewed them in 2014. We reviewed them uh, twice in all. And in our prior review, uh, we did note, uh, the legislative auditor noted that these preferences should be reviewed and clarified to identify targets and metrics for the number of jobs that you're looking for in these industries and also to establish criteria for when to transition from a full out ex exemption to a preferential rate. Our study questions include the following, how many and what businesses claim the exemption and how much tax is exempted each year? What's the change in total employment for beneficiaries of the preferences? What's the change in the total taxable income for the businesses that claim the preference? What percentage of total taxable income do the exemptions represent for these businesses that claim them? How do the preferences impact Washington's food processing industries for dairy, fruit and vegetable and seafood? And finally, how have the preferences impacted the cost of doing business for Washington food processors compared to other competitive states? Here's our contact information. I'd be happy to any, answer any questions you have on this or we'll move on to our last one. Um, Dana, um, I think there's going to be considerable interest in these preferences for food processors. Um, base, do you, will you be differentiating um, within sectors um, in regard to looking at profitability and um, whether or not the tax incentive um, is uh, how it relates to whether or not the it is more important to have a tax incentive or what its relative role is in retaining or creating jobs compared to location near food and other resources, as well as um, in, when we talk about employment, are we looking at um, wages with benefits, health benefits, and um, especially in light of some of the controversy surrounding food processors in COVID, um, looking at working conditions um, relative, not just total employment? Well, um Representative, we, we are looking at a wide range of um, analyses for um, comparing the value of the tax preference to businesses' taxable income, to the taxes they pay, to their gross income. So we're looking at a number of different analyses to try to determine what, um, what value this preference has um, 
overall on these businesses. Um, as far as the health benefits, um, that particular um, detail is no longer collected. Um, as far as I am aware, it's not collected by the Department of Revenue on their annual surveys, nor is it collected or published um, anymore by the Employment Security Division. So I don't know that is not within our scope uh, or our proposed study questions at this point. Um, and I don't know that we'll be delving much into that at this point. Um, uh, I think that might be something we may need to either certainly highlight if we don't have access to that type of data because it's going to be a question that a lot of people are going to raise. Yeah. It used to be collected on the annual incentive survey, but uh, the legislature did uh, change uh, that particular, um, made lots of changes in 2017, and that particular data is no longer collected for all uh, people that file it. It's only for certain industries that are specifically identified when the legislature passes incentives for them. Thank you for explaining that. Representative Orca. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the things that comes to mind with um, any tax incentive being reviewed at this point, so for all of the ones that we're looking at reviewing, um, is uh, pre-COVID conditions and, you know, during the COVID uh, crisis, um, there could be a, a huge difference in who claimed it, how much they were claiming, how much of an impact it was. Um, you know, some may have not have claimed it pre-COVID, but conditions were such that they needed to claim it during COVID. Are you going to make some differentiations between pre and uh, pre-COVID and and uh, during the COVID? Um, to give us some idea of what, what those impacts might have been? Thanks for that question, Representative Orcutt. Uh, we are, um, we're specifically looking at time periods from when we last reviewed this. So 2015 through the most current detail that's available to us. We do have, and we will be able to provide you with amounts per taxpayer and the taxpayer's names that are filing these. So we will be able to identify numbers and identities and amounts claimed for all of those years. And we are talking with a vast array of stakeholders at this time uh, and asking them specifically um, about COVID and its impact on their industries, their businesses, and how they see that. So we do hope to provide some information to you on, on what that have from the stakeholders point of view and from what we can see in use and everything on how it has impacted these industries. Thank you very much, Dana. Let's go to our last. Great, this is our last presentation of the 2022 reviews and the last for now afternoon. Uh, this is up for a property tax exemption for nonprofit hospitals. And we know that nonprofit hospitals have been exempted from property tax since 1889. JLAR previously reviewed this preference back in 2007 on our initial inaugural reviews, but many changes have occurred in healthcare in the healthcare industry since that time. This preference doesn't have a stated intent, uh, but the inferred intent was to support uh, provision of community benefits by the hospitals to their supporting communities. We note that federal income tax does provide a specific income tax exemption for nonprofit hospitals. And it is assumed that in exchange for that exemption, these organizations will provide community benefits that include charity care. Charity care is roughly defined as uh, providing medical services to people without any expectation for payment or compensation. And Washington state since 1989 has specifically required hospitals from all ownership types to provide charity care. That includes government run uh, nonprofits and for-profit hospitals. Our, uh, Review will address the following questions. To what extent has the preference been used and what are the beneficiary savings? What kind of community benefits do these beneficiaries provide to their communities? And is there information that allows us to compare the community benefits between beneficiaries and non-benefiting hospitals? 
Finally, we'll look at how the value of the beneficiary's charity care compares to their tax savings and how that in turn compares to charity care that's provided by non-benefiting hospitals. Here's our contact information for this study and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? So seeing none, um, no. our next steps for the tax preference reviews is we are working feverishly on them right now. We'll be before you in July of 2022 with our reports. And as always, our final reports uh, will be presented to you at your December meeting of 2022. Again, Pete and I are happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions about all three? areas of review. Well, thank you. I want to thank all the staff members uh, and guests who've uh, presented today and all the staff members who've worked on the reports. Um, terrific work done. And does anyone have any good of the order? Uh, Okay, at 1.30, the I-900 subcommittee, which is, again, everyone, um, will be meeting again uh, with a new link um, to hear the auditor's performance audit on workplace culture at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you, Senator Wilson, for sharing the afternoon session. See you all soon. Be well.